Tank has been made possible by Amgen, a recipient of the Presidential National Medal of Technology. Amgen, bringing better, healthier lives to people worldwide through biotechnology. Additional funding is provided by the John M. Olin Foundation, the Randolph Foundation, and the Lind and Harry Bradley Foundation. Hello, I'm Ben Wattenberg. The current welfare debate has focused attention on single mothers, but that's not enough. What about the fathers? Joining us to answer this difficult question are David Blankenhorn, president of the Institute for American Values and author of Fatherless America, Confronting Our Most Urgent Social Problem. Amitai Etzioni, university professor at George Washington University and author of the Spirit of Community, Rights, Responsibilities, and the Communitarian Agenda. Heidi Hartman, Director and President of the Institute for Women's Policy Research and a recipient of a 1994 MacArthur Fellowship Award, the so-called Genius Grant, for her work in the field of women and economics. And Elijah Anderson, Professor of Sociology at the University of Pennsylvania and author of Streetwise, Race, Class, and Change in an Urban Community. The topic before this house, The Sins of the Fathers, this week on Think Tank. Is the American family in trouble in-house fathers, married and unmarried, are a diminishing species. 25% of America's children are now being raised by their mothers alone. Let's look at some father figures. Illegitimacy rates are rising steadily. In 1960, 5% of all babies were born out of wedlock. Today, the rate is almost 30%, and the rate in the black community is almost 70%. Those out-of-wedlock births make up nearly a third of the children in single-mother households. But the majority of fatherless families are the result of divorce, separation, and abandonment. These facts have consequences. Children growing up in female-headed households are much more likely to have a child of their own before age 20, to drop out of high school, to live in poverty, and to commit crime. In fact, 60% of America's rapists and 72% of adolescent murderers grew up without a resident father. Why is this happening? What can we do about it? Let's go around the horn once, starting with you, David Blankenhorn. Why? Why is it happening? It's happening because we've changed our minds on the basic question of do children really need fathers? We have become a society that really doesn't know the answer to that question anymore. <clears throat> and so when we have 40% of the children in the country today living apart from their father, we are passive and we don't uh, have a culture of fatherhood that requires and expects responsible fatherhood any longer. Heidi Hartman. I think the reasons are primarily economic. I think we've seen a tremendous increase in the economic independence of women. They no longer need to marry to be uh, able to survive economically. And if economics is not going to be the reason for marriage, if women don't have to be forced into marriage just to survive, then we need to find other motivations for marriage and other ways of maintaining ties between parents and their children, even outside marriage. Eli? I would tend to agree with Heidi. I think that uh, economics is a very important piece. Uh, to the extent that uh, people have jobs and opportunity, uh, men, they tend to form families, I think. Uh, but I think jobs and economic opportunity is just a big, big part of it. And when we have increasing poverty the way that we do, we've um, got to understand that that's related to, to that. All right, Amitai? I see it as coming together of two trends the general destruction of the family, the devaluing of children, the decline of a sense of responsibility, and the destruction of all authority figures, from labor leaders to priests, from presidents to the press, the, de the destruction of authority. Both of them cross each other in the fatherhood. Hi, right, let me, uh, Heidi Hartman and Elijah Anderson, you are both talking about economics and jobs, but seem to be saying something different. 
you are saying because women have jobs, that encourages fatherlessness, and you are saying because people in poverty don't have jobs, mm -hmm. that encourages poverty. Now, um, is that a contradiction there? Well, we probably both agree on yeah. both points. <laughs> yeah. I'm saying that uh, what we see right now uh, is the fact that so many jobs are going out of the country. We, our big cities, are in the throes of deindustrialization. Many of these jobs are leaving cities, going to suburbs, non-metropolitan America. They're going overseas. When that happens, it has an impact on the availability of jobs in the inner city. There's so many inner city uh, young black people uh, uh, lacking skills, lacking education, lacking opportunity, uh, don't form families. But yet many of them have the same uh, sexual needs as people have always had. And this, these get realized, but when babies come, people don't form families. I mean, that's a big part of it. I think um, going along with what Amitai has said, I think that a lot of the other uh, pieces fall into place. When you don't have a job and you don't have economic opportunity, uh, authority structures, uh, values with respect to families tend to become shakier, I think. The way the uh, two points are related is to say that uh, the economic benefits of marriage are, are reduced for women when the men do not have good jobs. I think that's the point that Eli has been making, and I focused on the access uh, to jobs by some women on their own so that they need the men's job less. Or if the men's job is not available, mm -hmm. at least they can still have a child and still form a family. Mm -hmm. I just think it's real common in the policy debate especially to give an economic interpretation of this. I, I really think it's fundamentally mistaken. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the highest divorce rate in the world. We have a 31% rate of out-of-wedlock childbearing. We have almost half of the children in the country spending a big part of their childhood apart from their fathers. This is way beyond uh, the unemployment rate. It's way beyond, uh, you know, if, if more jobs and more affluence were going to strengthen family life, we would be a much different society today. The, the, the essence of this, I think, is a cultural shift in our generation We've changed our minds about what it means to be a husband, a father, uh, a wife, a mother. We've changed our minds about the institution of marriage. And yes, economics matters, but I think it is a, just a fundamental mistake. Do you think, Dave, to David, that when dwell on the economic right, aspects right. of this to but, the exclusion of the culture? But do you think that when people get married, and you stress the divorced and the the abandoned and the separated, as opposed to the out of wedlock birth, that when guys get married, in the back of their mind, they're saying well, I'm going to have a kid and then split? Or, I mean, that, when you say that's the culture, uh, m my sense is anybody I know who's getting married is not getting married with that in mind. They're getting married in mind uh, w with sort of traditional family values in mind, and then something happens. Well, first of all, 30% of the children born now are born to never married parents. And the fastest growing family trend in America today is out of wedlock childbearing. It's, it's, it's the fastest thing happening out there, and it's growing faster among whites than among non-whites. It's growing faster among people who've been to college than people who haven't. And so, uh, you know, loss of blue-collar jobs, an unemployment rate of, what is it now, 8%? This does not explain this fundamental civilizational shift that we have experienced in this generation over whether or not children deserve fathers and whether or not we have standards of male responsibility on this issue. To, to, to drive it down to um, unemployment, I, I think, you know, of course it matters, but I think we miss the fundamental if we don't understand this essentially as a cultural Let's question. Let's get uh, Amitai in here for the communitarian view of this. Clearly there are economic factors, but even there it works both ways. When you break up a family and you create two households, and you don't have more income than before, you increase the cost. So it's not only the economy that's driving up the breakup of the family, the breakup of the family has uh, poverty-producing consequences. But uh, I'd like to talk for a moment about the importance uh, of having fathers, because there's some very interesting sociological studies of this. And basically what they argue is somewhat sophisticated. They argue that for a child to grow up proper, it needs two engines. One is which produces basically love and security and reassurance. And the other, the pressure to achievement, uh, to reach and break up, in effect, the comfortableness, the coziness. And that you need these two engines to work hand in hand. Now, it's not necessary, and not often in other societies didn't work this way, 
that the father was the achievement of the disciplinarian and the mother was the warmth and affection. But the separation of roles seems to be essential. And one more thing, that the two will be in coalition with each other rather than fighting each other. So well-developed children have both a, a love engine and an achievement engine and a coalition between the two. He Heidi, can you have a successful child without those factors? Well, I think you can, but you do it through combining them in the same parent. We're relying on other adults, the, the grandmothers, the grandparents, the teacher. Uh, and I think many children obviously have succeeded coming from single parent homes. I, I think I, 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 I... Are you distressed about this diminishment of the numbers of children or rates of children without fathers? I am distressed about uh, what David called the failure of, of fathers to take continuing responsibility for their children. I think, though, that some of the cultural change that we all seem uh, to be regretting these days has been positive. I think for people to escape oppressive marriages, to escape alcoholism or drug addiction of a spouse, uh, to escape violence, these are all uh, positive cultural values which women put up with for their whole lives because they saw in the past no escape from these marriages. So there's a positive side to it as well as a negative side. The abusive <clears throat> and violent and alcoholism, drug abuse, this accounts for a relatively small fraction of children today living apart from their fathers. Most of it comes from parents where there's not violence and abuse, they just don't get along together, and A, they never got married in the first place, or B, the, uh, most marriages today end in divorce. So it's, it's just wrong to say, a 40% rate of fatherlessness today is okay because we want people to be able to escape abusive relationships. Yes, we want them to, but 40% fatherlessness doesn't come from cases of, you know, acts murdering and drug abuse and violence. But it just, the, being the numbers don't add uh, up. I, I, I didn't expect to find myself on the slide of Heidi here, but uh, l let me say that uh, there are other ways for men to be oppressive to women without waving an axe. So what we need is not a, a simplistic return to the old family, but we need a new family of equal partners in which uh, people will both assume their roles and supplement and complement each which other. Which is what we have today among most married couples. If you do the interviews and look at the clinical evidence, the married women today will say, I get a much better deal from my husband than my mother got from my father. Fathers today, married residential fathers are more involved in child rearing. They do more work in the home. They are more emotionally expressive. They tell their children they love them. They do all the things that we want them to do under a companionate, e more egalitarian model of marriage. The problem is their ranks are thinning every year. And so it's not, it's, this is not a gender oh, role issue any more than it's an economic let, let, issue. Let, let me ask one. Uh, Eli, you, you commit sociology on the ground. That mm -hmm. is your specialty in the inner city particularly. Can yes. you tell us and our audience, what are you picking up there? What do you hear? What are these young people saying who are yes. the topic of our conversation? Yeah, no, I, think, I think just to respond to David um, and Heidi here, um, Anna Maita, I mean, the, the, um, the, um, it, it's very important to understand the economy is important. It's very important. The other cultural issues are there as well. I mean, I'm not denying that. I talk to young people in the inner city. I talk to young men who don't get married. And I say, why? Why don't you get married? You have this child. Uh, young men tell me, uh, I can't play house. I can't play house. What that means is that they can't play house the way they like to play house. They like to mimic the American dream oftentimes. They have a conception of that. Um, <clears throat> mother, father, at home, children picket fence, the whole bit, that's extreme perhaps a little bit, but this is a vision. But given the jobs these young men are able to get, or not able to get, uh, they can't play house in that way. And the young boys understand that without a job, without economic opportunity, they can't expect to dominate that house. They can't tell the woman what to do. They can't tell her how to dress. She will talk back. She might do other things that they don't like to the extent that they don't have economic uh, ability to um, to tighten up that situation. Yeah, I mean, not two and weeks sometimes, change that. and sometimes, and sometimes, the abuse that you talk about is related to the inability to, to control the household through economic means. A lot of the men would like to be fathers, like to be husbands, but on their terms. Now, their terms oftentimes uh, gets us into tricky water with sexism, domination, that kind of thing. But 
a lot of the young men uh, see um, the wider culture as being involved in these kinds of relationships, and they'd like to mimic some of these. Most of what you're talking about is cultural analysis, and I agree with it, and you've written provocatively about it in your book, Streetwise. What the, I guess the, the point I would respond to mm -hmm. is y that's true, mm -hmm. and therefore let's talk about the culture. Let's talk about what it means to be a man, what it means to be a father, what it mm -hmm. means to be a husband, but I think that it's a little too reductionist mm -hmm. uh, to simply drop it all down to this question of, of uh, jobs. Of co jobs are terrific, let's have more of them, but isn't this really, um, you were talking about the culture. You were sure. talking about cultural yeah. attitudes yeah. there. Yeah. Poverty, ask one. poverty works against the family. Yes, that's, that's right. right. Poverty works against that's the family. Right. We have had periods in relatively recent decades where poverty was higher, uh, unemployment was higher, and out of wedlock birth was substantially lower. Mm -hmm. So why are you, you and Heidi particularly, making this point that there is a, a direct causal effect yeah. between unemployment and poverty and out-of-wedlock? I mean, certainly if you go back to the Depression, you did not have high out-of-wedlock uh, uh, rates of birth, and you had very high unemployment. Sure. And Something, very, uh, something's happening. Poverty. Something's happening. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of giving you the ethnographic story. This is what I observe. These are the... Um, things that young men say. I think that if we had more opportunities for independent income, you'd probably see more family formation. That doesn't mean that it would be exactly the way we might want as middle class people, uh, or people who are very concerned about sexism, domination, that kind of thing. But I think more of these men would try to form families if indeed they had economic opportunity. Without economic opportunity, people get by any way they can. Yeah, but, but you know, the, the I was just looking at this. Um, the rate of um, teenagers graduating from high school, black and white, is at an all-time high, and there is almost parity now between blacks and whites, which is an astonishing fact for any of those of us who have studied data over the years. So that would seem to say, I mean, it's like in the high 80s or low 90s for both whites and blacks, <coughs> Uh, that would seem to say that there is opportunity for advancement. They mm -hmm. are following through, mm -hmm. and yet you have this this cultural thing that David is talking about. And also, it's not, I mean, just the numbers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> compare the unemployment rate to the fatherlessness rate. It, it's just, it's wildly out of proportion. If you ask people in a community, what would you like to, which number is the most, the worst number in your neighborhood? The unemployment rate or the fatherlessness rate or the out of wedlock childbearing rate, it's the, the cultural trend, this abandonment of men from the lives of their children is dwarfing mm -hmm. anything that's going on in the economy. Hey, let me just add here something because it, it's really dangerous to turn this into a ghetto issue. Mm -hmm. it, it's oh, not I like, yeah. a, and it's I want to get out of there. Faster among Absolutely. whites than among blacks, faster among college educated than non-college educated. So, it's a societal let, issue. Let's talk about the absence of fathers in the middle class. Right. And, and there again, uh, obviously, at least economically, they're somewhat more comfortable, mm -hmm. and there the cultural factors stick out even more clearly. And there is, I, I completely agree with David, there's an abandonment. Mm -hmm. uh, it, there's a study done in Pennsylvania showing that mm -hmm. within a year, uh, fathers who are, are divorced or separated, you know, just forget about their children. This mm -hmm. is like uh, almost an incredible lack of responsibility and not, commitment. Not much sure. child but support, you know. not much visitation within a, a year or so after divorce. And so, the, the fatherlessness um, engine in our society, I think, is cuts across class and, and really, with some important exceptions, has very little to do with the track that the economy is on. Time out for a minute. We're talking now about what's broken. Heidi, why don't you start? If it's broken, how do we fix it? What can we do? I think one of the things we haven't done is adjust public policy to meet the needs of basically uh, the two working parent family. Uh, something like a shorter work day, something like real assistance with child care and elder care for these families. The mothers have taken on a tremendous new responsibility for financial support of the family. And I think although some fathers are certainly participating more in child care and the housework they also have to do to maintain the family, others aren't. And I think where we have public policy or public institutions that can support the families, um, 
for example, through um, eating canteens that would be very common in, in your neighborhood school. You pick up your children after school and you have dinner there before you go home. Uh, this was something we apparently had in World War II. So there are lots of ways to support uh, working families through public policy, and uh, not the least of which is financial. I think all working parents that are low income, whether they're single or married, uh, should have access to financial support from the rest of us. Uh, Eli, do you have a little kit of remedies the way uh, Heidi does? Well, if you assume, I mean, I think the, the cultural change issues are there. Are certainly things are changing in certain ways. And I think there's a devaluation of the family and all that. But I think that if we assume that um, the transformation is going on and that there is distress, uh, not only among the very poor, but also the middle classes, certainly various institutions are going to be under stress, including particularly the family. Now, I would say that when young people have a sense of the future, have a really positive sense of the future, they probably don't get pregnant as easily as do um, uh, people who don't. I think that if you compare people that I study, inner city poor young people who get pregnant the way they do, uh, if you compare these people with, with white and black college students, uh, there's probably just as much sexual activity going on, but the college students don't get pregnant. The reason is that these people have a positive sense of the future, a sense that if they do certain things, then their future is going to be disrupted. The, the inner city poor don't have that same outlook, and that's got to change. If you want to do something in terms of really trying to instill values, you've got to change that situation, and that's where the economy comes in. That's, that's why so many young people don't form families, I think. Amitai remedies? Well, I'm all in favor of giving people hope, but we need to help young people to communicate better with each other. It's a teachable skill. Our study shows that couples which break up fight about as often as couples who stay together, but the second couples fight better. They don't attack each other personally, they attack the issue, and there are many teachable skills which we should teach. You mean that, that remarriage is, is uh, less turbulent than first marriage? No, no, before uh -huh. you get married in high school. Oh, you sh oh, we I should see. teach you how to resolve conflicts, so when you get married, the marriage is going to last better. Many churches and synagogues now insist before they marry you that you come for several meetings in which they'll see if you're together on how many children you're going to have, what happens if you have to move and your, the other one has a job. It's taking marriage more seriously. We surely need to change our evaluation in which we uh, cherish when people dedicate themselves to their children. We, we need flex time. We need child allowance. I'm all in favor of the $500. Uh, it's just a starter. All other countries give you, all other developed countries give you a year of paid leave, uh, fathers and mothers. So we need to work on both sides of the street. But let me say one thing as a father of five sons, that as a father of five sons, that uh, in the end, it's a question of dedication. And nothing I did in my life has been more rewarding, despite whatever uh, feathers I have in my cup uh, than uh, having spent uh, uh, time with my sons. And I just want to tell the viewers that try it, you're going to like it. Yeah, I, will, I would endorse that uh, without uh, any equivocation. David uh, Blankenhorn, I know uh, you are traveling around the country uh, with your new book, uh, Fatherless America, um, and, and you are uh, purveying a set of remedies or near remedies. Could you give us a brief, uh, y your mantra briefly? Well, let us improve the economy as much as we can, yes. Let us do have assist working couples with child care, but basically the challenge before us is a culture shift, a change of heart and priorities about whether or not children deserve their fathers. And the basic idea is uh, the divorce rate's way too high, out of wedlock childbearing is wrong, and every child deserves a father. Now, if we change our minds on those set of issues in that direction, we'll change some of our public policies, welfare, tax, et cetera. We'll change some of our institutions, daycare centers in the junior highs, and so on. There'll be legal changes, rethinking no-fault divorce laws. But the basic issue, and I think that we tend to just almost bend over backwards not to say this honestly, the basic issue is attitudinal, it's a normative question about what it means to be a responsible father and what it means to be married. So it's an attitudinal shift. In my uh, effort with the National Fatherhood Initiative and going around and having these community meetings is to twofold. One is let us have a national debate on the crisis of fatherlessness. 
Two, let us resolve to reverse the trend by changing our minds on the basic question of does every child deserve a father? In the wake of that change, many other legal and public policy changes will happen. I mention a lot of them in my book, but, but the central quest, the most important thing to change is our minds. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Sioni, David Blankenhorn, Elijah Anderson, and Heidi Hartman. And thank you. Please send your questions and comments to New River Media, 11507 17th Street, Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20036, or we can be reached via email at thinktv at aol.com. For Think Tank, I'm Ben Wattenberg. This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media, which are solely responsible for its content. Think Tank has been made possible by Amgen, a recipient of the Presidential National Medal of Technology. Amgen, unlocking the secrets of life through cellular and molecular biology. Additional funding is provided by the John M. Olin Foundation, the Randolph Foundation, and the Lind and Harry Bradley Foundation. To order a transcript or a video cassette of this program, please call 1-800-70-THINK. It's $10 for a transcript or $29 for a video cassette plus $250 shipping and handling. Or send a check to Federal News Service, P.O. Box 2500, Washington, D.C. 20009. Hello, I'm Ben Wattenberg. This week on Think Tank, we'll take a look at fathers. 25% of American children grow up in a fatherless home, increasing their chances of poverty, unemployment, and a life of crime. Where have all the fathers gone? Our guests will have answers and questions that will surprise you on the next edition of Think Tank.